So let the show begin. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Lauren, L O R E N. Uh, Fluke, F L U K E. Okay. What year were you born? Uh, 1920. Do you remember where you were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, yeah, I was on Mississippi Street in San Diego, and uh, the guy with the, the paper boy was coming up and down the street selling papers. Life is good, we're safe, and at times it's very relaxing. That's what's so great about this country. But there's a reason all of what I just said is true. Some take it for granted, others could care less. Me? I thank them every chance I get. This sea of white headstones can be found in most major cities in America. I look out at a view like this and can't help but think of all those men who fought through hell. Some died on foreign soil, some came home. But every one of these headstones has a story to tell, with no one to tell it. All of these stories will go unheard for the rest of time. It's quiet here. But these headstones scream a million words for those who will listen. These were my heroes growing up. They didn't wear spandex, a cape. Hell, their underwear was underneath their pants. If it wasn't for the greatest generation, we would all be speaking Japanese or German. That's why telling the stories of those we have left is so beyond important to me. We are losing these heroes too rapidly. So my mission is to sit down with as many as I can, to let these unsung heroes have their chance to be heard, before it's too late. What, uh, what part of the country did you grow up in? Uh, southern Iowa, on an 80 acre farm. I was born in the uh, house that my dad built. Now he was a, uh, well, he, he wasn't a, he wasn't a, he wasn't a miner, in other words, he didn't go below and dig, but he, he operated in the elevator, lifted the mules up and down, and the, and the war workers, they had to lower them down, up and down, and, uh, and uh, so I don't know how many thousand tons of red shale that that mine produced, well, which was useless. Well, they had finally put it on the roads, but it was, it did cut up tires, just something fierce. So they, they it, it, that red shale was, become useless as, as the years going by. Well, I got a driver's license when I was 14. Now, you wonder why I a driver's license at 14. Well, my other brothers and sisters had gone somewhere. I mean, they wasn't living at home then. So the, the state would give you a driver's license. Well, I was the only one to, to take mom or dad to the hospital or, or whatever, or the grocery store, yeah. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. I was on Mississippi Street in San Diego, and uh, the guy with the, the paper boy was coming up and down the street selling papers. Yeah. What, what made you go from Iowa to San Diego? Uh, a job. Uh -huh. I started driving uh, rivets on the B-24 wing and finally transferred over assembling the Catalina. Uh, it wasn't too many of them in the, uh, in the Air Force. It was mostly a Navy ship, the Catalina, you know, it was a boat. Uh, later they made, put landing gears on it so you didn't, you didn't have to have water for your Place to land. Okay, so you you joined the Air Force before uh, before Pearl Harbor, or was it through like a Boeing? No, no, they uh, no, I was drafted. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, the so up at uh, San Pedro, I guess it was there in Los Angeles, the induction center. Well, to back up a little bit, uh, 
uh, we'd moved to Des Moines in 1935, so from uh, where I graduated from North High, uh, and during, let's see, yeah, what was I going to say? Oh. Oh, well, at the induction center, okay, I, 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 I had spent three years with the 168th Infantry, 34th Division of the uh, Iowa National Guard. Now, who, was, who had more experience to get to go to the infantry when they drafted me? But they didn't ask me what I did, and they didn't, <laughs> I didn't tell them. <laughs> Man, when they said you're... You're stationed to go to Buckley Field. I knew that wasn't infantry. That was the that was the highlight of it. <laughs> a little weight off your shoulders. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so from uh, well, I don't know if you want to hear all this stuff or not. Oh yeah, um, yeah. we're going to start from. Oh, from okay. Where, when you left to to go to basic training. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. We took basic training at uh, Denver, and also there was a place where we. Well, I trained on the Norden bomb site, and uh, okay, but and so on and so forth. You didn't. We, we were going to send us to England, you know. And they said, you, "Hey, we, you got, We don't need no precision Norden bomb site. We, we drop our bombs on the lead plane, as he drops them. It's the same as dropping a bomb. Same switch. Yeah. So." Uh, well, anyway, they they said, "Well, you're going to the Pacific, the uh, Nadzab, New Guinea." Okay. So be before we get that far into it, what uh, what was it like saying goodbye to your parents going to basic training? Well, just I uh, didn't uh, didn't didn't bother one way or another. Just you know, uh, it was just a way of life, and uh, I don't I don't know if they realized it, but I did that I wasn't central to the infantry. You know, well, with that kind of experience, who would be better qualified than me? <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, so you're waking up your first day in boot camp and you start to get yelled at. What's going through your mind? Well, uh, not just just day by day. Nothing, nothing special. Uh, let's see. Well, we're, well okay. From uh, I was assigned to out of Lowry Field where we took one training on the Norden bomb site. Well, they said, you're going to be a, a tail gunner, number one, which which I was, but um, I flew more up here in the nose than I did in the tail because the Japanese, I guess, figured they were, they were more effective coming in and uh, getting one of the four engines or than back there getting just me with <laughs> with a turret. Anyway, that's, that's the story on that. Okay. So, I know you don't have a choice in which way to go. Did you want to go fight the Germans or did you want to fight the Japanese? The Japanese, yeah. Well, why is that? Well, why is that? Because they attacked us. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't any warning. Yeah, no, I shouldn't say that. There was a warning. There was a Navy personnel said the ships was coming, uh, number of ships coming in. Those were Japanese ships off a of carrier because uh, each day of each week the flights of airplanes would come in from the United States. And he said, Oh, there's a flight of planes coming in. They didn't pay no attention to us. Could have been a lot different, you know, if you hadn't noticed them. Yeah, oh, well, heck yeah, if we'd had. Uh, if, if they'd have listened to that guy, we could have we could have got their carrier right then and there. I mean, if we had enough fighters there on uh, uh, in Hawaii to do it, well, we did, yeah, because they <laughs> knocked out a bunch of them, you know, on the bomb run. And uh, of course, they sunk the Arizona. Uh, well, plus other ships, but it had to go go down with a lot of a lot of men aboard. Yeah. Uh, the the See, good good part, the, uh, we had a, a, a ship, a tanker, carried all the fuel for high octane for the for our engines for this and the other, uh, so uh, it got out. It 
and didn't get hit. Otherwise, we would, well, we would have been, you know, no fuel for the, our airplanes. Because I don't know how many million gallon that 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 tank. I don't even know the name of it now. What it held, but uh, anyway. That's, right. that's so it. when you're leaving basic training and you're heading to the Pacific, do you remember? Did you go by a ship, by a plane? How, how did you mm -hmm. get to the, to the no, islands? No, we, we, we left Sacramento in one of these. Yeah, with the boat underneath. Okay. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about about the the boat hanging. I've I've never heard that before. Really? Yeah. What what was it you guys were doing up there? Well. Uh, Okay, now I was made in Sandusky, Ohio. How I can remember that, I can't even remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> by, by a boat company there in Sandusky, Ohio. And uh, 27 foot, two outboard engines, and uh, a lot of 10 and 1 ricing, plenty of food, dry clothing, and everything. And uh, for a telephone, they had two crank things to commute to anybody that we could, you know, if you got shot down. However, we, uh, the, the days that I flew, we, we never did drop a boat. But our squadron, of course, they dropped when, uh, when the Indianapolis got hot, or got hit. But it was, uh, it was two days after they got hit time we got word. But we, of course, went out with our B-17s and dropped the boat and to as many survivors as you could, could, you know. And were you were you on that mission or was? The, no, no. I uh, uh, apparently it came in when um, I might have been on another flight that day, but when we got word about it, well, I, uh, no, I, I wasn't on that mission to the Indianapolis. No. Okay. How did that make you feel when you heard about the Indianapolis? Uh, I guess you just have to accept it, you know. <laughs> were you guys told anything about the sharks, or was it just? They were sunk. Well, yeah, they were. Well, they knew that after they got out there about the sharks. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. But they had that skipper aboard, uh, uh, court-martialed. After the war, he was still alive, and the the, the Indy wasn't running a zigzag course, and he said it wouldn't have made any difference. We had it zero, zeroed in. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so you you land on your your first island. Where was your first island in the Pacific? Well, it'd been the Hawaiian Islands, if you consider that an <laughs> island. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know if it was, uh, I can't remember, the, there's Tarawa and Canton, and there were one or two other ones for, where you had to stop and get gas. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and you, boy, you can be thankful that you got a a good navigator because there's a lot of water between between gas stops. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so going from the island, going on to a run, what were some of your guys' uh, targets that you were going after? Well, we, when we got to Ned's Ab New Guinea, the well, we still had the boat underneath, and they said. We want a we want a bomber outfit. You guys don't you got no business here at Nads Avenue, Guinea. So I don't know. They give us orders, and we start coming back up through. Uh, well, out of Nads Avenue, Guinea, you, you hit uh, oh, the big island out there. Uh, what is it? The Solomons. Well, they're in that group, yeah. But anyway, come on up through and the um, the Wake Islands and and uh, Philippines, finally stopped at Philippines north of, uh, north, 30 miles north of Manila, called uh, Esquire Strip. So it was just us and a bomber group stationed up there by ourselves. So we, we both worked together. They was the bomber and we was there to drop my boat if they got shot down. And they all made it too. <laughs> yeah. So what what was going through your mind when you were no longer carrying the boat and now you're a bomber and you're now set? Well, no, 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 we never did change to a bomber. Oh, okay. no, no, we remained air to sea rescue. Oh. From the up to the day I left, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So tell me about walking into the tail and getting situated by your by your gun. Walking into the huh? 
walking into your station, sitting, you know, getting into the ball turret and everything at the tail? Oh, well, no, the ball turret, no, I, I, I was originally scheduled tail turret. Okay. No, the ball turret was too small. In fact, we we dropped our our ball turret gunner back in the states because uh, you couldn't. We had the ball turret, but you couldn't operate it with a boat on. And so it we carried that ball turret for <laughs> no good reason. I don't know why we didn't salvo it and close that hole up, but they they didn't. They just left it down there. Okay. Did you ever experience any zeros coming up behind you? And no, never, never experienced an attack. Really? No, no. Uh, the one coming in from the rear. Well, I figured I had a uh, plus. Uh, I think our, our velocity and range was greater than than the fighters were, sort of, and uh, so I figured I had a twenty-five percent chance that he's coming in. Is he going to make a left? Is he going to make a right? Is he going to go up? Is he going to go, which way is he going to go? So I can plan to move that turret to the position I think he's going to peel off before he hits us. Yeah. Uh, of course, I was hoping I got him before he had a chance to, <laughs> to, to do anything else. But no, we were never attacked by, uh, by, the, by the Japanese. Come close. You know, but uh, they, I guess, uh, I guess they figured there's too much firepower there to uh, get too close to them. Of course, we had the, they added the turret here and the nose and and uh, two more guns on the side, and I believe they added that one on top. So we had a, a lot of firepower, plus the top turret, and then there's another one back there where the radar guy, the turret for him in case he. In case, in case we had to have somebody operating a turret, you know. Yeah. So, uh, let's see, from there, from um, uh, there on Luzon. Okay, our next stop, I think, was uh, uh, Ies Ieshima. Uh, well, that's where the, the, the Japanese uh, group flew in, the surrendering part. We, we were right there on that little old island, I had seen it. Just across the water from, everything's across the water from something out there. <laughs> well, well, the big island, Okinawa, is almost, well, you could see it, you know. So, I don't know how many miles that was, but anyway. Well, did you guys ever hear of any rumors of the Japanese that was floating around any of the, uh, the bases or anything, about the pilots or anything like that? No, I never. Uh, I, I talked to a uh, to a soldier there on Guadalcanal, and uh, uh, he was telling about uh, the Japs. Japanese had had, had captured one of well, one of his, and they uh, uh, cut his tentacles out and put them in his throat. Said we we never took a uh, we never took a prisoner after that. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the end of the prisoners taken a Japanese prisoner taken alive. Yeah. After that, maybe other field, but with him, at least him and his buddies, they uh, uh, that done it. Yeah. So yeah. my my grandfather was on Luzon with the army, and that's where he was wounded. But till his dying day, he hated the Japanese. Yeah. 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 Not that, not the case I'm finding so much anymore. Yeah, well, the well the. The people, uh, well, okay, we ended and we, from Iwashima, we, uh, our next stop was at Suga, Japan. So, okay, we, the, the, uh, the war's already ended there, they signed. So, uh, so we radioed in for clearance to land there at Suga. <laughs> I said, yeah, you can't land here, there's too many potholes in the runway. <laughs> well, give us an alternative base, which they did, and I don't know, a few, not two of them, maybe less than a half hour away, you know, had plenty of fuel. So, that, and then, and then after we got settled in our barracks there at, at Sugi, uh, it caught a fire. There was three, it was in three sections, uh, kind of like a, 
what was it? It was the Japanese Navy base is what it was before we, yeah. So, uh, so here's the, you know, here's the mess hall across the aisle as my my bedroom, and man, that smoke started coming through, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll pitch my locker out the window. Uh uh. There's not no time to pitch no locker out anyway. You just get out of there and feel you're lucky that you made it. It was a gasoline stove that started it. The leaking, you know, like, hello. Well, of course, uh, well, that, that, was, that was that was the end of that thing. Well, uh, and in the process, well, they said, no, you don't need to tr close the fire doors. It won't. It penetrated that and the other third section. All our records are just burnt. No record or nothing. Oh, you didn't know if I was didn't know if I was a private or a <laughs> colonel. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Might have worked in your favor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so let's see. I guess that's uh, that about ended it. And uh, uh, well, then there in Japan, we still did air to sea rescue if, in case somebody went. You wouldn't be from bombing, but from mechanical failure or whatever. So, uh, yeah, the top sergeant, he came through where we were staying a kind of a, well, it wasn't a barracks after we got burnt down, it was just kind of a <laughs> place where they kept horses, I think. <laughs> so, uh, that, w that was that. Do you remember hearing about the end of the war in Europe? What was your guys' reaction when you heard about Hitler? Well, I was just uh, just glad to hear it, I guess. There wasn't anything real specific. I mean, uh, to me, there wasn't any celebration, of course. Because uh, you uh, guys were still fighting. So. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the day the war ended, uh, we were sitting, we were covering a, the island of Formosa. Uh, I don't know, I think it changed the names to Taiwan or vice versa. Anyway, we we was coming in about halfway back to the base there on on uh, Luzon, uh, north of Manila, and uh, it, uh, the reception was rather poor on the radio, but it, it had indication that the, that the war had ended. Well, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. Anyway, uh, after we landed, we we, we were. Well assured, everybody was getting drunk. Yeah, so uh, they were cel celebrating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. So, what was it like coming home after after the war, setting foot on American soil again? Uh, yeah, we. Uh, well, the see, uh, the, the first. I don't know if I finished that. Anyway, he said you can you can go now, you go home, or you can wait two weeks and fly. I said, well, I'll go now, and man, within within an hour, I was packed, and we were headed up to Yokohama to get a board to gout your victory. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a process on that thing. Uh, anyway, they claimed they were stopped out there in the northern Pacific, the Great Northern, for an operation, but uh, I don't know, uh, I don't figure, you don't stop, you'd be better off, keep the thing moving, anyway. They had shut down power, and a wave hit us sideways. Well, I don't know, it almost turned us over, it seemed like. Anyway, here's the, it's the supper time, or chow time, anyway. So here's the, all these, I'm sitting at the end of the table, and here's the aisle. And when it hit, <laughs> all that food in them guys' place, I just picked mine up. <laughs> all their food went on the floor. <laughs> Well, kind of funny, but at least I, I still had my food. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they weren't too happy about that, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so then, of course, our next stop was, uh, oh, what's that island out there in the San Francisco Bay, uh, the noted for years and years, uh, Alcatraz? Yeah, we pulled up alongside there. I guess we had a couple passengers to get off, but uh, no one there. Falling you up and down the, uh, with with them high powered rifles, you know, you make you make sure just the only guy that got off was supposed to get off, 
and I think we took on a, uh, a, a couple of passengers. We were headed down to, uh, well, around L.A., the, 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 the place there where the boats come in. I forget. I don't even know the name of it now, but anyway. Down by Fort MacArthur? Uh, yeah, Sandy yeah, right. right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So w when you get off the boat, who's the first person you you saw as far as your f friends or family? Um, I guess it was my brother-in-law. He lived in Long Beach. Yeah, he was probably the first first one I'd have seen, yeah. Did he serve as well? Did he, did he what? Did he, was he in the service as well? Uh, no. No, uh, no, he was only the, the only one of the brother-in-laws that, uh, that, uh, that didn't. Well, he was, well, I don't know if he's too old or not. They took my brother, he was 42, and he, and he had two kids, so uh, <laughs> you can't say, well, uh, he was too old. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what, did you, what was your career after, after the service? Well, let's see it. Oh, I got a job back at uh, Convair. Uh, there was uh, th then they were building a, a two-engine uh, uh, passenger plane. You know, forget the name, number of it. But in fact, I haven't heard much. Of it. I haven't heard much of it since. I don't know if it <laughs> wasn't any good or what. But anyway, you just couldn't get away from the airplanes, huh? <laughs> yeah. So uh, then. Uh, I worked, work, worked for Convair, then we were building that airplane, and then, uh, then they quit, I guess, built, full, fulfilled their contract. So I went over to work over at North Island, uh, overhauling airplanes, putting them together and taking, taking them apart and putting them back together. And then while I was there, I signed up with the Defense Part Department of Defense, Defense Supply Agency, as a quality control inspector. So uh, I finished my <laughs> finished my career working as a with the quality control uh, inspector. That's where you retired. Yeah, I uh, I still get blamed for uh, a, a rocket takeoff at uh, Cape Canaveral, and uh, well. Roar Aircraft, which is in San Diego, they built the, well, similar to this thing right here, uh, with a shield in it, right at the, uh, the beginning of the exhaust, you know, it's set there vertical, or yeah, then, uh, of course, there's a great, great amount of exa exhaust when that thing fires off. Uh, anyway, uh, they, the, uh, uh, Roar said, uh, I, I told him, well, I, I, can't, I can't stop you from shipping them, but I'm putting a non-conformance stamp on them. And man, you'd thought the president himself was violated something. When I, when I got down there and they, uh, and they saw that stamp on them, oh, <laughs> uh, you can't do that. Well, I did it, didn't I? <laughs> well, otherwise, they just went, I mean, it proved out they, they hadn't qualified the matrix. The stuff that well, it's called a honeycomb type material to you know so uh, to deflect the exhaust so it didn't go up and ignite the fuel, yeah. Wow. So anyway. Okay. So in, in between islands and everything, did you ever have any R and R time that you might have? Played some baseball or no. had any fun memories or anything nah, like that? No, it wasn't any, wasn't any hard, hard time, no. <laughs> no, it was, uh, I guess, I guess that took place, well, I don't know if it took place during the war or not, did it? Uh, you remember or recall anybody? Um, so, some of the guys had a couple of weeks here and there really? to yeah. go yeah. swim and drink beer. And yeah, drink. I remember the guys in, in the European theater was, uh, had R and R time, but, uh, uh, I don't, I don't think so in the Pacific. Where are you, where are you going to go? It's like a thousand miles between water. You want to go to the beach or you want to go to the beach? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. Do you, uh, do you still talk to anyone you served with? No, let's see. No, not, 
not since uh, we, we used to have our re reunions, the Third Emergency Rescue Squadron. We've, we've got, well, uh, Dayton been there and down in Dotham, Florida, and different places we've had, but uh, I forget when we stopped having the reunions cause <laughs> because there wasn't, wasn't enough people left to have a re reunion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you could talk to some of those guys one more time, what would you tell them? Well, I guess I just have to say how lucky we were. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never got hit with a, with a, uh, enemy fire of any kind. You know, those, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, every, uh, they were twin 50 calibers. And those bullets, you know, they have a armor-piercing bullet. In fact, I got four or five of them for 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 a center center punch steel. That man, they're they're the, they're, the, they're the hardest and the toughest there is. Yeah, that point never you never have to sharpen that point. I mean, maybe I didn't maybe I didn't punch enough whole, uh, things in steel to, but they still got them. So well, they were with my son and and uh, yeah, Branson, Missouri. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I painted them blue so we didn't get them mixed up with just an ordinary 50 caliber. You know. Yeah. Okay. When we get ready for for a flight, first thing we do, we pull pull these props through nine times by hand. Somebody. Well, of course, there's usually four of us. So actually, uh, you, you did about one engine, and uh, and you know why they did this? Why's that? These were radial engines, and if they set, not knowing, we didn't know how long. Was, but we pulled them through to make safe to clear the bottom cylinders of, of oil that may have seeped past the piston and f filled up down in there. And of course, the compression would be terrific. Uh, if, if if you didn't clear the clear them, of course, uh, when we got to our own squadron, those guys was real good. They'd even had the engines running for us. So. <laughs> Couldn't ask for anything any better than that. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you uh, let's see, well, I don't know what. Anyway, there's right cyclones, radial nine-cylinder engines, and uh, if you. Had to bail out, especially if you was up here in the nose and the pilot or co-pilot. Uh, you better feather this engine for you, otherwise you're hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so we ne never had to feather that one to, to uh, um, never had to dis abandon ship. Uh, in fact, I only, I only snapped on my chute once, and that was coming back in off of. Uh, uh, it was on the lose on the weather was so bad uh, the pilot and co-pilot they just uh, couldn't hardly control it you know and that was the only time that uh, I ever snapped a shoot on and the pilot said well said, I knew if I'd give the order to bail out you'd never make it down through that through this kind of weather and well you know your chute would open of course but you, you'd never make it. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, back to this. Uh, uh, this is in Tampa, Florida. This, we, we haven't left the states yet. So we took off and bang! The smoke starts rolling out of that engine and uh-oh. But uh, while I was checking with the pilot and co-pilot there, well, hey, our, our, our oil pressure is remaining okay and our RPM is okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't shut it down. Let's just keep her spinning, and we'll get around, and f we'd just taken off. So we just get around and come in and land, which we did. Of course, they had the ambulance and everybody waiting for us there, when we? But anyway, to make the story shorter, uh, this crew chief, the ground crew chief, well, if you guys had to pull them engines through these, yeah, that wouldn't have happened. Oh, I finally got to talk to him. I said, now, what school did you go to? This is a top cylinder that blew. 
had no bearing whatsoever, did we or didn't we pull the engines through. However, we never failed to pull them through. So uh, they, they didn't teach you to, uh, you have to pull them through to clear a top cylinder. But anyway, the thing kept spinning and just wasn't a fire, just smoke, excessive oil pumping out of that, and that piston still hanging in there, going up and down. Well, you, you was down on your, kind of down on your knees back there. It wasn't a, it wasn't a turret, it was just a position you took. And you just moved back and forth. Oh yeah, you just well you just move the guns back and forth. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you uh, were you were back there pretty far away from everyone else, huh? <laughs> yeah, the closest personnel would have been the waste gunners. Uh, you know, well, there was one on each side. There the waste gun, and of course the tail wheel. I usually had to make sure it was uh, down. Well. The pilot, he, he knew it was down, but I had to make sure it was locked. That's so when you land, didn't do that. Well, after we taxied, he landed and taxied, then I, I unlocked it so it could, you know, you could park. The tail wheel would pivot then. But we, we, it was solid forward when, for landing, yeah. What, what was it like getting up in the air for the first time? Well, let's see. Well, that was at uh, that was at Kingman, Arizona, gunnery training. Yeah, I was in Laughlin for a couple of years. We <laughs> go to and, Well, uh, anyway, I was up there in the pilot's compartment there, and uh, he said, "You ever see one of these fly on three engines?" And, no, I said, I "Don't don't believe a care to either." <laughs> anyway, he he feathered the one engine and. Yeah, that was my first flight on a B-17, and uh, it flew just as good on three as it did four. <laughs> yeah. Look at that smile. Huh. Okay. Okay. Now this, uh, well, that was in the early stages. Finally, I made, well, out of gunnery, tra gunnery training in, uh, uh, let me think of the town in Arizona where it, it don't matter. It was a station there in Arizona uh, where we took gunnery training. Uh, uh, it was uh, Buck Sergeant out of gunnery training, and then I made Staff Sergeant after I got overseas. Now that's for I never never got very high rating. <laughs> uh, apparently, this was at the very beginning. <laughs> Do you have any advice for younger veterans coming back from war? No, I hadn't given much of a thought. I guess I just <laughs> just a routine procedure for when the war was over. You know, everybody getting home as soon as they could, and uh, uh, and none of my uh, family they all made it. The ones that my brother-in-laws. Well, I see my yeah, my brother went in too, but uh, he was 42 and had two kids. And they said, "Why in the world would they uh, draft somebody with age 42 uh, when with a family?" Well, it didn't make any difference. That's the way it is. We got to have, we got to draft so many, and it don't matter if you got 10 kids and uh, whatever. That's, that's the way it was. <laughs> yeah. So what uh, what would you tell um, kids nowadays and w what do you want them to remember your generation for? Well, uh, I don't know, gosh, I don't know, just uh, uh, a little training. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I don't, I don't recommend anybody training for the National Guard because it's all mostly infantry. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, it's a tough go. It's, uh, you're doing all the walking. And, yeah. And then the fighting, of course, when you get into combat. Yeah, we, uh, in fact, the company, I, or not the company I was in, but the company that met on, I'll say, a Thursday night, we met on a Wednesday night each week. Well, they was, they was drafted on the first, Oh, uh, the invasion of uh, 
German in. And they, they wasn't all killed, but there was 100% casualties, casualties, either killed or, or, or injured. Those guys that I knew, you know. Yeah. And uh, I guess our company didn't happen to be at that spot uh, on the invasion. Uh, I never did hear uh, how many in my company, well, I'll say my company, the one I was in, I don't know how many of them made it or didn't. Yeah. So, what's the secret on making it to 99? Boy, I just, I guess just a day at a time, uh, about the only thing I've, uh, I've had a few kidney stones, kind of got a bottle, a bottle of those, <laughs> uh, uh, but I never had to, never had to get operated on for, for the kidney stones. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think the luckiest thing was when, when I was after being drafted. The luckiest thing was when when he announced announced you're going to Denver, Colorado, Buckley Field. Man, I knew that wasn't infantry, because two or three of my friends they inducted the same day I did. They, they was drafted into the infantry. The one, well, I guess, well, he didn't get hit, but he was in Germany, or, or Europe, he was a, a driver for some uh, high official there, so he drove the jeep. So he got pretty good duty, considering him being an infantry man. He didn't have to carry that rifle, and a, I don't know, it had a belt, I don't know how many bullets it carried in it. <laughs> Yeah. What do you got planned for tomorrow? Are you guys going down to the parade or anything? Go going down where? Going to the parade or anything for Veterans Day? Is, it, is that in San Diego? Uh, there's one in Marietta. Oh. Over by Old Town. No, Marietta. I don't know if they are or not. Okay. I don't know if they are or not. I heard about a concert in, in Temecula over at the Civic Center. Oh. There's a concert at about 6 o'clock. Really? Just I heard about know. that this morning. I know you guys okay. were over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, cool. uh, from a member of the church, shared with me that they were oh, doing cool. a concert over there. Okay. So. Okay. Well, since I got him here in the hot seat, you guys have any questions for him? Anything you've always wanted to ask? <laughs> yeah. No, because we've heard, of, we've heard a lot of it. I, I would say, one of the things they didn't tell you about how you made it to 99 is, is uh, whiskey and bacon. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> Such a healthy combination. Hey, yeah. you know what? If it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> he was married when he was drafted, so Good. He, he wasn't back in Iowa. He was in San Diego, and so the person he left was my mom, not his parents. Uh, she followed him all over the states when he was doing his training. Really? Wow. How'd you guys meet? Well, uh, like I say, my, my wife. Well, they met in high school. Yeah, her mom, of course. <laughs> you got to think who who belongs to who here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they met in high school. He came out and got the job, and then she, then he sent her money with the letter saying, "Here's money," and you know, and you know, and sweet stuff in it. I have the letters. Oh, so that's cool. Oh, well, that's very cool. Yeah. One thing we was on our trip from here to Tampa, Florida. Uh, McNeil Air Force Base there. That's where we took the air to sea rescue training. But uh, anyway, of course, it was gas rationing, and and anyway, we was up to Riverside where my uncle had a shoe store there. Anyway, it don't matter. Uh, and they said, well, you'll never get no, they'll never give you no stamps to travel that far. You know, I think there's, I think there's only good for three gallon each stamp, if I remember right. Well, anyway, instead of having a extra container and and and, and carry some extra gas, no, I didn't do that. We well, ran out of gas somewhere there in Missouri, so and it was cold weather. So uh, I I just told the wife, I said, well, okay, I'll hike on into town. You just start the engine and keep warm. How are you going to start the engine? You haven't got any gas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay.
And another, well, I'm coming back. Another thing on the automobile, it quit out there on the desert. There, I don't know how many miles from anybody is out there. Anyway, I remember passing a, a filling station, a gas station, <coughs> back down the highway. So uh, I said, well, I'll hitchhike back there. And I had her and a load of sailors in this 35 holes. <laughs> and uh, I went back there and, uh, to that station. So I said, uh, by any chance, is any of them cars out there in the junkyard? Uh, by any chance, they've got a coil? Uh, well, yeah, he said, they probably do. He said, I got a new one. But he said, it'll cost $5. Well, I said, I can't, it don't make any difference the cost. Let me have it. <laughs> so, uh, took it and hitchhiked back and it fired off as soon as I put the new coil in. Now that, uh, I don't know, all I knew I wasn't getting any fire to the plugs. Well, it could have been a condenser, could have been a bad switch. Uh, just lucky, you know, you got, you got a coil and got going. Hello everyone, my name is Wyatt Roos and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what Patreon is and how you can help support my project. Patreon is a monthly private subscription where content is made just for you. Donating even $5 a month gives me the ability to document the true stories of the Second World War and its heroes. You get access to first-hand experiences of the war and what it was really like to be there. When you support this project, you're supporting unsung heroes directly to continue my mission. With your support, I'm able to spend more time on meaningful work that will have a positive impact. Join me on Patreon and let's not let our heroes be forgotten. So come on this journey with me and experience the true stories of the Second World War and its heroes. Thank you very much for watching this video. I have to go get ready and do an interview with a Pearl Harbor survivor. And you know what? Why don't you come with me? So I always start off my interviews asking where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor, but you were actually there, weren't you? Right. Right, okay. Right, right up in the West Virginia. So how did you not only survive Pearl Harbor and World War II, and then also you're, what, 96? 97. 97. So you, how, how did you make it that long? My faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. The power of the Holy Spirit is what guided me in everything I did and said. Wow. Thank you for taking your time out with you me bet. today. I appreciate it. You bet, Wyatt. Follow me on these interviews that will take you to the past through the eyes of these amazing veterans. For full interviews and to donate to Unsung Heroes Project, please visit the link below. Your donations, likes, and shares, and social media support are greatly appreciated. God, we don't know what our fate might be. We only ask that if die we must, we'll die as men would die without complaining or pleading, safe in the feelings that we have done our best for what we know is right. Dear God, watch our over us, our families, watch over us in the fire ahead and with us now as we pray to you. Move out. Dear God, in a few short hours, we'll be in battle with the enemy. We do not join battle afraid or ask for favors or indulgence. We only ask, if you would, use us as your instrument for freeing the world. Dear God, we don't know what our fate might be. We only ask that if die we must, we'll die as men would die without complaining or pleading, safe in the feelings that we have done our best for what we know is right. Dear God, watch our over us, our families, watch over us in the fire ahead and with us now as we pray to you, move out.